Mr. Poskett's Nightcaps Chapter 12 A Man or a Mouse Prologue The cleverest man I ever knew was at the same time the wisest and kindest hearted of men. Not that the possession of wisdom, nor the grace of kindness to his fellow creatures, made him clever in a high degree, but that when I was in the journeyman stage of learning, feeling my feet as it were, he gave me what I have ever since known, not considered mind you, but known, to be the best and most invaluable advice that one creature could give to another. It was this, put into short words, and, mind you, this man was a big man, and a very successful businessman, inasmuch as he raised one of the biggest concerns in his own town out of sheer nothing, and died a rich man, having used his wealth kindly and wisely at a time when things were not what they are now. Poskit, thou no but a young'un, there's going into it, world, and they'll find that there'll be plenty of men to give thee what they call advice. Now, I see in all world of human nature, and I'll give thee better advice nor anybody that they'll ever find. Cause I know. Listen to me. Number one. If steer to trust in nobody, trust everybody. Till they finds them out. When they finds them out, if they ever does, trust them again. Nee man's a bad'un, see long as you get on reet side on him. And it's your own fault, mind you, if you didn't. Number two. Didn't think over much about making brass. It's a good thing to make brass, and a good thing to be in possession on it. But brass is neither here nor there unless you wear it on your friends. Save your brass as much as you can. Keep it for a rainy day. You never know when that rainy day is coming. But don't strike at a sixpence when you know that half a crown wouldn't make a difference. Didn't take your sweetheart to market. And let her come home with a penny ribbon when ye know in your own heart that ye might have bought her a golden ring. 3. To end up with, trust every man ye meet. Not like a fool, but like a wiseacre. Love your neighbours, but take good care that they love you. If you find that they don't, have naught to do with them. But go on loving them all the same. If there is retribution, it won't fall on you, but on them. But at the same time, you must remember that every one of us makes the other. And to sum up all the lot, every man it were ever born on this earth makes himself. Part 1 In one of those old Latin books, which I sometimes buy in the old bookshops in the market towns that I visit, out of which I can pick out a word or two, a sentence or two, especially if they are interleaved with schoolboys' attempts at cribs, there is a line which I, at any rate, can translate with ease into understandable English. A line that always puts me in mind of my old wise friend's blunt sayings. Every man is the maker of his own fortune. And that's why I'm going to tell you this story of a man who did three things. First, made himself a millionaire. Second, lived in a dream while he was in the process. Third, came out of the dream when it was all too late. Now we will begin with him. Part 2 Samuel Edward Wilkinson when I first knew him, was a small boy of twelve who, in the privacy of the back garden of a small provincial grammar school, ate tarts and apples which he never shared with his schoolfellows. He was the last of a large family. I think his mother succumbed to the strain of bearing him, the tenth or eleventh, and he had the look of a starved fox which is not quite certain where the nearest hen roost is. The costume of small boys in those days, the early forties, did not suit him. The tassel of his peak cap was too much dependent upon his right eyebrow and the left leg of his nankeen trousers was at least an inch and a half higher than its corresponding member. Poskit, he said to me, the first time I ever indulged in any real private conversation with him. What shall you do when you leave Dr Scott's? Go home, said I. He was eating one of his usual jam tarts at the time, and he looked at me sideways over a sticky edge of it. Poskit, what's your father? he asked. My father's a farmer, but it's our own land, said I. He finished his tart thoughtfully. Then he took out a quite clean handkerchief and wiped the tips of his fingers on it. He looked round, more thoughtfully than before, at the blank walls of Dr Scott's back garden. I was sensible enough even at that age to see that he was regarding faraway things. My father, he said, after an obvious cogitation, is a butcher. He makes a lot of money, Poskit, but there are eleven of us. I am the eleventh. When I leave school, he stopped short there and from his trousers pocket drew out two apples. You may think that he was going to give me one. Instead of that he looked them over, selected what he evidently considered the best, bit into it and put the other back in his pocket. When I leave school, he resumed, 
I mean to go into business. Now, what do you think of business, Poskit? I was so astonished, boy as I was, to hear this miserable mannequin talking as he did, that I dare say I only gaped at him. Between his bites at his apple, he continued his evidences of a shrewd character. You see, Poskit, he said, I thought a great deal while I've been here at Dr Scott's. I don't think much of Dr Scott. He's very kind, but he doesn't tell any of us how to make money. Your father's got a lot of money, hasn't he? How do you know? I said rather angrily. Because, said he quite calmly, I see him give you money when he comes to see you. Nobody gives money away who hasn't got it. And you see, Poskett, although my father makes a lot of money too, he doesn't give me much. Sixpence a week. How do you get your tarts and your apples then? I asked. He gave me one more of those queer glances. My mother and my sisters send me a basket, he answered. Of course, Poskett, we've got to get all we can out of this world, haven't we? And I want to get on and to make money. What do you consider the best way to make money, Poskett? I was so young and irresponsible at that time, so full of knowledge of having the old farmstead and the old folks and everything behind me, that I scarcely understood what this boy was talking about. I dare say I gave him a surly nod, and he went on again, very likely, for all I remember, eating the other apple. You see, Poskett, he said, there's one thing that's certain. A man must be either a man or a mouse. I won't be a mouse. I was watching his face. I was at that time a big, ruddy-faced lad, with limbs that would have done credit to an offspring of Mars and Venus, and he looked the sort that would eventually end in a shop with white cheeks above and a black tie under a sixpenny collar, and a strange revulsion came to me, farmer and landsman though I was, and I let him go on. I won't be a mouse, Poskett, he said with a certain amount of determination. I'll be a man. I'll make money. Now, what do you think the best way to make money, Poskett? I don't think I made any answer then. I've thought it all out, Poskett, he resumed. You see, there are all sorts of professions and trades. Well, if you go into a profession, you've got to spend a great deal of money before you can make any. And in some trades, you have to lay out a good deal before you can receive any profit. But there are trades, Poskett, in which you can get your money back very quickly, with profit. Now, do you know, Poskett, the only trades are those which are dependent on what people want. You can't live without food, or clothes, or boots. Food, Poskett, is the most important thing, isn't it? And why I talk to you is because I think you're the wisest boy in the school. Which trade would you recommend me to enter upon? Go and be a butcher, I answered, like your father. He shook his head in mild and deprecating fashion. I don't like the smell of meat, he said. No, I shall take up some other line. Then, as the smell of dinner came from the dining room, he added the further remark that as our parents paid Dr Scott regularly, once a quarter, we ought to have our money's worth, and so walked away to receive his daily share of it. Part 3 Samuel Edward Wilkinson duly left school and became, of his own express will, an apprentice to a highly respectable grocer, who enlarged upon his respectability by styling himself a tea merchant and an Italian warehouseman. The people who visited the shop, which was situate in a principal street in an important seaport town, were invariably impressed by the powder blueness of the sign and by the red goldness of the letters which stood out so plainly from the powder blue. It had a cachet of its own, and the proprietor had two daughters. But Samuel Edward was then scarcely over fourteen years of age, and as his parents and the proprietor were of a distinctly dissenting nature, his time was passed much more in stealing sugar candy out of a newly opened boxes and in attending prayer meetings at the nearest chapel than in following the good example of London prentices of the other centuries. In fact, by the time Samuel Edward Wilkinson was nineteen years of age, he was not merely a money grubber, but that worst of all things, a tradesman who looks upon God Almighty and the Bible as useful weights to put under an illegal scale. And as Samuel Edward gained more of his experience in the knowledge of his fellow make-waiters, the more he began to believe less in his fellow men, with the natural result that certain women who were not his fellows suffered. As he grew up, Samuel Edward naturally had to live somewhere else. His master had no room in his house for apprentices who had approached to maturity. But, like all masters of that early Victorian age, he knew where accommodation in a highly Christian family was to be had, and Samuel Edward found himself en famille with a middle-aged dressmaker and a pretty child, whose sweet sixteenity was much more appealing than the mature charms of his master's daughters. Samuel Edward was not without good looks, and the child fell in love with him, 
and remained so for longer years than she had counted upon. But Samuel Edward was as philandering in love as he was pertinacious in business, and the idea of marriage was not within his immediate purview. At what age do you think a man ought to marry, Poskett? he said to me, during one of his periodical visits to the old village, he being then about two and twenty. When he feels inclined and means it, said I. Of course, Poskett, a man should never marry unless he marries money, he continued. For a young man in my position, now, what would you say the young woman ought to be able to bring? I had sufficient common sense, even at that age, to make no reply to this question. I let him go on, silent under his sublime selfishness. Don't you think, Poskett, that it's only right that when a man marries a woman, he should expect her to make a certain amount of compensation, he said. It's a very serious thing, his marriage, you know, Poskett. Anybody with my ambition, which is to be a man and not a mouse, or, in other words, to pay twenty shillings in the pound and keep myself out of the workhouse, has to look forward a good deal. Now, there's a young lady that I know of, where I lodge, in fact, that's very sweet on me, but I don't think her mother could give her more than a couple of hundred, and, of course, that's next to nothing. You see, Poskett, I want to have a business of my own, and you can't get a business without capital. And money's very hard to make, Poskett. I think, I really think, I shall put off the idea of getting married. That's the very wisest thing you can do, I said. But you'd better tell the young lady so. Well, you see, Poskett, he answered, stroking his chin. The fact is, there are two young ladies. The other one is my cousin, Kezia. Now, of course, I know Kezia will have money when her father dies, but then I don't know when he will die. If I could tell exactly when he'll die, and how much Kezia will have, I should make up my mind. As it is, I think I shall have to wait. After all, it really doesn't make such a great deal of difference. One woman is about as good as another so far as marriage is concerned, Poskett, isn't she? The money's the main thing. Why don't you go and find a rich heiress, then? I asked. Ah, he replied. I only wish I could, Poskett, but you must remember that I've no advantages. My father's only a butcher, and trade is trade after all. You've great advantages over me. Your people own their land. You're knobs compared to what I am. But I shall make myself a man, Poskett. There's only one thing in the world that's worth anything, and that's money. I'm going to make money. Part 4 I never saw Samuel Edward Wilkinson again for a great many years. In fact, not until he came back to the village to marry his cousin Kezia. It was then publicly announced that Samuel and Kezia had been engaged since early youth, but anybody who knew anything was very well aware of the truth, that the marriage was now hastened because Kezia's father was dead and had left her a thousand pounds. During those intervening years, Samuel Edward had been steadily pursuing his way towards his conception of manhood. He had spent several years in London, and never wore anything in the way of head covering but a silk hat. Yes, Poskett, he said. It's taken me a long time, but I've saved enough money at last, with Kezia's little fortune thrown in, of course, to buy my first master's business. It's a very serious thing, his business, you know, Poskett, and so is marriage. But Kezia's a capable girl, you know, Poskett, very capable. As Kezia was then quite forty years of age, her capability was undoubted, but it seemed to me that Samuel Edward had been a long time making up his mind. "'And where's the young lady of the early days?' I asked him. He stroked his whiskers and shook his head. "'Well, you know, Poskett,' he replied, "'it's a very unfortunate thing that she, of course, resides in the very town where I've bought my business.' "'Is she married?' I asked. "'No,' he answered. "'No, she's not married, Poskett.' Of course, I couldn't think of marrying her when Kezia was able to put her hands on a thousand pounds. After all, everybody's got to look after number one. It's a very anxious time with me just now, Poskett, I do assure you. What with getting married and setting up a business, I feel a great deal of responsibility. If you're ever our way, and I expect you'll be coming to the cattle markets, call in and I'll show you the improvements I've made. It's a very fine position, Poskett, but it's a difficult thing in these days for a man to get his own. Part 5 Samuel Edward's name duly appeared in blazing gilt on the powder blue of the old sign, and he and Kezia settled down in a suburban street in company with a handmaiden and a black and tan terrier. Their lives were discreet and orderly, and they went to the particular dissenting community which they affected at least once every Sabbath day. At eight o'clock every morning, Samuel Edward repaired to business. At seven in the evening, he returned home to pour out his woes to Kezia. 
One of his apprentices had done this, an assistant had done that, a customer had fled, leaving a bill unpaid. Kezia, who was as keen on money-making as her husband, was invariably sympathetic in these matters, which were about the only things she understood, apart from her knowledge that her thousand pounds was in the business. She and Samuel Edward were both resolved on making money. And suddenly came a thunderstorm over their sky. The little dressmaking lady, having been formally engaged to Samuel Edward for long years, finding herself jilted, suddenly awoke to the knowledge that she had a spirit, and caused the faithless one to be served with a writ for breach of promise. And Samuel Edward's men of law, going into the matter, told him that he had no defence and would have to pay. Samuel Edward took to his bed, and refused to be comforted. Kezia wept, entreated, cajoled, threatened, nothing was of use. All was over, in Samuel Edward's opinion. The other side wanted the exact amount represented by Kezia's dowry, £1,000. Samuel Edward lay staring at the stenciled wallpaper and decided that life was a distinct disappointment. He would die. Then Kezia took matters in hand. She, with the help of an astute man, paid the £1,000, whereupon the little dressmaker, who was still well under 40, promptly married another. And then Kezia literally tore Samuel Edward out of bed shook him into life, and gave him to understand that from that day forward he would have to work harder, earlier and later than he had ever done before. And Samuel Edward fell too, under a ceaseless and never varying supervision. Part 6 I'm a warm man, you know, Poskett, he said to me many a long year after that. A warm man, sir. There's nobody knows except myself, Poskett, how much I have. No, sir, made it all, you know. Look at my business, Poskett, one of the biggest and best businesses in the country. Twenty different establishments, four hundred employees. Bring my own tea from Ceylon and China in my own ships. All the results of energy, Poskett. No sitting still with me, as you rustics do, no sir. Now, let us analyse what this man really was. Because Kezia literally drilled him into the pulling of himself together after his first great slap in the face, he began to amass money and very soon so deepened his boyish instincts that money became his fetish. Money, money, money. Nothing but money. He estimated the value of a man by the depth of that man's purse. He thoroughly believed, with the northern farmer, that the poor in a lump are bad. And at last he was a very rich man indeed, and then found, as all such men do, that he had no power to enjoy his wealth. He could travel and see nothing, for he did not understand what he saw. He could buy anything he liked and have no taste for it. The little dressmaker had children, he had none, and as his wealth increased, his temper grew sour. He had never read anything beyond his trade journal and his newspaper, and therefore he had nothing to think about but his money. And so I come back to what my old friend said in his bluff Yorkshire fashion, they didn't think o'er much about making brass. It's a good thing to make brass, and a good thing to be in possession on it, but brass is neither here nor there unless you wear it on your friends. And whether Samuel Edward Wilkinson considered it in the end of his days that he had made a man of himself, or whether he had, after all, a sneaking idea that he was a little more than a mouse, I can't say. But his great idea, that he could buy so many people up ten times over and feel none the worse, had a certain pathos in that fact, that even to his dull brain there came at times the conviction that when the end came he would be as poor as any mouse that ever crept into its hole.